Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Flow Show. Uh, good morning to uh, my two colleagues. Good morning, Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Steph. Good morning, Kay, Ryan, everybody. Ladies and gents. You know what? Good stuff, yeah. Cool, cool. Did you see, uh, did you uh, see hey, Portugal without Ronaldo yesterday? They were flying. Yeah, I know. I know. It's, uh, <laughs> what, a, what a game, though, Morocco and Spain. It was... Yep. Uh, when I, was, I was watching uh, most of it, one of those games where you, you almost get out of breath. It was just end-to-end -end stuff. There wasn't much goal mouth action, but um, it really was up and down, up and down. Um, yep. And an uh, exciting penalty at the end uh, sealed the deal. Uh, unfortunately for Spain, uh, commiserations to Jane. I don't know if she's listening this morning, but um, yeah, Spain are out, um, which is no bad thing if uh, you're one of the teams still in it. They were one of the favourites. So, uh, yeah, now we've got a bit of a break. I don't know what, what we're going to do with ourselves now. There's no football for a couple of days. Uh, <laughs> you get used to it, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, so let's uh, get stuck into stuff this morning. Plenty going on again, uh, as usual. Um, as usual, we'll start in China. And um, further measures or loosening of measures of covid um, coming in overnight and this morning. Um, they're going to consider downgrading COVID status uh, to help remove the need for strict controls. Um, COVID has a very high level on the infectious diseases, um, viruses scale. And so they're potentially looking to downgrade it uh, to uh, a level of uh, stuff that's not as bad like HIV and viral hepatitis. Uh, so, uh, how they oh, don't consider gosh. those to be <laughs> yeah consider that a downgrade um yeah, yeah but that's what they're gonna that's what they're looking to do anyway but it means that they can therefore loosen some restrictions there there have been a few more lockdown rule changes um now become more national um so um they're banning the covid movement restrictions in non-high risk zones and um, they're going to allow home quarantine for some COVID cases, uh, patients, and for COVID close contacts. Um, and they're gonna scrap the requirement nationally uh, for COVID tests uh, in most public venues. Um, now reading some of the, the stories that are coming out, what, what a lot of that means is that rather than shutting down or locking up a whole apartment complex um, for, for a single case or a couple of cases, they're now going to just limit that to particular floors. If it's an apartment building, uh, if it's a, a housing complex, um, it'll be limited to just that house that's affected or the houses affected rather than the whole compound itself. Um, so that's the, the kind of loosening we're talking about here. Um, but officials were out uh, making sure uh, to keep feet on the ground by saying the new easing measures are not a passive reopening. Um, and they're going to hold another epidemic control and prevention press conference on Thursday. Um, so more details to come from that uh, on what we call in this great reopening, um, although it's not as reopening as uh, many expect. Um, more on the market front, uh, China's gold reserves have risen for the first time in over three years. Um, that came uh, alongside some of their other numbers for FX reserves and the like. So gold reserves are up. Um, usually what we get is, is the value of their gold reserves, which obviously fluctuates for the gold price. But the fact that this is a, they've added to gold reserves uh, is a bit of a story. Um, may have been behind some of the bid we've seen in gold uh, previously, uh, although it's not done much uh, on that headline anyway. Um, Trade data for China was looking particularly bad last night. Uh, where was it? Over here. Um, a big drop in activity. Exports down 8.7%, uh, imports down 10.6%. Um, so some big uh, numbers there. And this, I think, is maybe getting most of the, the headlines or the market moves playing into the global recession fears. Um, uh, oh, much Ryan, we, we can't see your screen, actually. Oh, I've not shared my screen yet. Sorry, oh, yeah. I think you were just talking about the uh, uh, the news and stuff. Uh, but, there we go. Uh, there we go, yeah. There we go. Um, so, yeah, as you can see there, exports and imports both down, so a big drop in activity there. Um, and as I say, I think this is playing into some of the moves we're seeing 
particularly in oil. You know, as much as we got the positivity from the, the reopening headlines um, in the super nuts world, growth is lower. And that's going to be the bigger driver for markets coming amid uh, what we're seeing weakness pretty much around the globe in things like the PMIs and other data. Um, so that's having a bigger impact at the moment than uh, possible positivity from all these reopening headlines. Um, so that's something that uh, we need to keep an eye on. Um, over to Japan uh, and speaking of reserves, their Forex reserves have risen for the first time in four months, um, apparently to a level unseen since December 2016. Um, that's according to the Ministry of Finance. Um, and that was up to the end of November. Um, why is that quite significant? Well, they did a, quite a bit of intervention, which would have lowered reserves um, at the time. So it looks like they've potentially built those back up again or have been building even while intervening. Um, so as much as we, I think it's, uh, and Kay can correct me, we're up to about 45, 50 uh, billion, I think total over the, the two uh, and a bit uh, interventions we had, Kay. So the fact that reserves are up, they, they've been covering those as well. I think it was even more than that. Uh, over all the interventions together, I think it was more than that. But um, anyway, yeah, I mean, perhaps they are doing... <laughs> They're doing S and B and the trading it around. So trading both sides, yeah. <laughs> sell off, sell from one fifty down to what is it, one forty three, four five, and then uh, pick him up again in the one thirty. Say, hey, happy days. Um, yeah. No, it seems that there's there's um, um, been some kind of reval of uh, other foreign assets in there as well, and uh, which which. Um, was uh, responsible for at least a part of uh, a part of the uh, the increase, but um, yeah, we can't rule out anything these days, right? Um, perhaps they they covered part of their stealth uh, interventions. That's that's possible as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think the 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 end market has reacted a little bit on those numbers. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And uh, but there's also been some some other news as well. Um, Bank of Japan's uh, Nakamura said that the need to continue with easing persistently um, and current price rises are not accompanied by wage hikes. Um, and Japan is far from a situation where a wage inflation spiral becomes a concern. Um, so pretty much echoing uh, what others have said, Kuroda especially, uh, that they're waiting for wages to really pick up and. Uh, make uh, inflation more uh, persistent and stable. Um, now, there's been an, a story pumped around um, that the Bank of Japan may ditch the yield cap next year. Um, I think Kay mentioned it uh, in yeah, passing on Monday. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's been pumped around again, but the main reason it's been pumped around is just a, a refile by Reuters changing um, some of the accreditation. Um, in that so if, if you see that floating around today it is a story from Monday I believe um, and say that that Kay mentioned uh, sorry mate would you add into that um, no no that's exactly it so it's a rehash and just a correction of some stuff yeah yeah um, over to the Japanese government and uh, it seems that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing um, according to uh, Gigi, Japan ruling parties are going to seek spending cuts to fund this uh, defence spending increase that they're going to look to do. Uh, I think it was 43 billion uh, they were looking to finance for defence. Um, so ruling parties are going to seek spending cuts to finance that. And they also say um, that they're going to seek a tax hike for leftover defence funds. Um, and then pretty much straight after that, um, an LDP policy chief, Hagida, said they're not considering at all to raise taxes next year. Um, so, as I say, I don't know what's going on over there. Some say they're going to hike taxes uh, for that. And then someone else is saying they're not going to hike taxes at all. Um, so toss a coin for that one. Um, over in the UK, uh, Another bit of a story that apparently was out uh, last week, but uh, didn't get any traction, but got some traction yesterday. UK Chancellor Hunt is said to be back in a review of city unbundling. 
um, they call it. This is one of the promises of Brexit was to roll back some of the, the MIFID regulations, um, or at least not go as tight on some of them. So basically an easing of regulations for the city, which is obviously uh, positive for London's firms, financial firms, um, if they're not tied to so many regs. Um, I think that put a bit of a wind in uh, the pound yesterday. Came That story dropped about 15 minutes before the fix um, yesterday. So I think there was a bit of fix action in there as well. So we've got, a, we've got quite a strong wind behind the pound um, over the fix yesterday. Um, it's done a bit of an unwind since there. Uh, you can see that move right in there. Um, so yeah, this story was apparently first out in the Times last week, but uh, not that I recall it. So it may have slipped under the radar as headlines could often do, and it's been picked up uh, in the second round there. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on for the pound. Um, ECB, they had a consumer survey out and consumer inflation expectations rose to 5.4% from 5.1% over the next 12 months. Um, so that's consumers expecting inflation over the next 12 months. Um, but over the more longer term three years, that number was unchanged at 3%. Um, now, as we've been mentioning on the on the show, expectations of inflation are just as important to the ECB and other central banks as the actual numbers are. Um, and keeping those expectations grounded is part of the message that the ECB will want to convey with monetary policy. They don't see inflation expectations out of control at the moment, um, but they are continuing to rise as per that survey. Um, and that will be an influence on monetary policy to come. Um, right, looking back at some of the data as well from yesterday, uh, here we go. So we had also had trade, some trade balance data from the US um, as well. Not looking too bad on the whole. Um, the uh, trade balance there, that one there, the deficit easing a tiny bit, 78.2 billion. Um, I did have a quick look at the numbers and uh, one of the big ones is obviously China um, and the deficit there decreased by 6 billion uh, to 26.1 billion. Exports increased by 1.4 billion um, while imports decreased by 4.6 billion. Um, so a bit of uh, an hour in, in the deficit with China there, um, obviously big for the US, depending on how uh, all these sanctions and chips and everything else uh, comes into the mix. Um, going across some of the other data, Ivy PMI um, a bit better uh, than expected. Looking good for Canada there as well. Um, in Australia, there was the AIG Services Index falling further into contraction uh, on that one. Um, a positive Tenkan survey there, eight versus two prior. And coming across to this morning, um, GDP in Australia um, was a little, little worse than expected quarter on quarter, 0.6 versus 0.7 prior. Uh, year on year, missed expectations, but was up still quite solidly um, over the last read. Um, as you mentioned, the Japanese data there and uh, leading indexes data in Japan as well. Um, positive versus last month's uh, negative number. Um, upper touch there over expectations. Um, just coming into the UK as well, um, house price data is uh, getting a bit more attention here in the UK. House prices in NOV down 2.3% um, versus minus 0.2 expected. And so a bigger, steeper dip there. Uh, German industrial production coming in not as bad as expected, uh, but still a weak number there. Um, and then we had some of the other trade data from the Eurozone retail sales, retail sales in Italy uh, coming in not as bad as expected there as well. Um, so that's it on the, the data front there. Not a lot out uh, for the rest of the day, apart from the Bank of Canada. Um, that's going to be the main focal point. Um, we do get MBA stuff out shortly, um, but otherwise, some other minor data from the US, um, but it's going to be the Bank of Canada, which we shall touch upon in a moment. Um, right, just to clear some of the other headlines uh, there, oil markets uh, are still roiling. Price of crude is 
continuing to drop. Uh, fresh lows again this morning for wherever you want to look, whether it's WTI or uh, Brent. Um, there's some fun and games in Turkey. Uh, mentioned yesterday about uh, ships being held up, tankers being held up uh, for paperwork checks, uh, and stuff like that. But there's been an official from the uh, G7 and Australia coalition um, saying that the $60 cap that's been placed on Russian seaborne crude um, has not been responsible for these delays. Um, now, noise out of Turkey is that they're checking the paperwork for insurance and, and stuff like that. Um, but uh, apparently all but one uh, appear to be carrying um, Kazakh oil, not Russian origin oil. And that's not subject to the price cap uh, under any scenario. Um, so apparently only one ship is, is Russian originated. Um, so not sure what Turkey's up to over there. Maybe playing some fun and games uh, with that. Um, Russia is said to be uh, mulling a price floor for oil sales in response to the G7 price cap. They have reiterated they won't sell oil to those countries taking part in the cap. Um, now, something that has, has been really been picking up um, in the last few days, um, and I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if it's something we need to take a bit of a closer or keep a closer eye on over the days and weeks ahead. Um, we know that Ukraine is now actively um, attacking sites within Russia, well within Russia, uh, air bases and the like. Um, and that happened uh, again overnight. Um, Russia um, apparently has requested a UN Security Council meeting for 9th of December um, and wants a meeting on Western weapon supplies to the Ukraine. Um, the US has come out with a bit of a response saying it's not enabling or encouraging Ukraine to strike beyond its borders. Um, and I did mean to see another story, I think yesterday, where uh, apparently that some of the armaments that the US has sent to Ukraine, things like missiles, they've been tinkered with so that they can't reach or go beyond Ukraine's borders, um, depending on where they are, obviously. Um, but they've been restricted, if you like, into the range of some of these weapons. Um, but Russia, uh, Ukraine is apparently using drones now to, uh, as I say, mark targets in Russia. So it's possible that we're going to get maybe a stronger Russian response to that. And it could be an escalation um, in the conflict over there. Um, we need to keep an eye on that. I think I wouldn't say we're all a bit lethargic about the Ukraine stuff um, ongoing, but it seems to the last few months it seems to have been the same old same old news um but this is a seems to be a bit of a step up um and i think it might be something the market's going to take attention to if it creeps higher um while we're in the us um the the uh, secretary of state sherman said that russia must remove all its troops from the ukraine period um that's full stop for those that speak the queen's or the king's english um over to China again. Um, and uh, this is one of these messages that pops up that's nothing in itself but a message in itself, if you know what I mean. Um, so there's a headline that China and Russia held their regular premier meeting via video. Um, some might say, so what? Um, but from that, uh, one of the head honchos, Lee, said China and Russia are to safeguard a smooth supply chain um, and that China and Russia will optimize border clearance. Um, so it's a little bit more touting of China-Russia relations. Um, again, this all falls into the, the, this geopolitical stuff that's going on with UK and Russia, China, Taiwan, military drills, hither, tither. Um, you know, there are all these games going on um, at the government level, geopolitical level that are bubbling under the surface. Uh, and it's all playing into everything else. Um, so, again, something else to keep our eyes on we've not got enough knives in this game um guys you got anything you want to throw into the mix yeah a couple of things i want to say uh first the uh, headline you talked about uh chinese gold uh we have to remember that these are you know it, it, for a while the uh, the actual number 
Uh, actually, no, not for a while. Let me start again. The actual number is uh, still unknown. You know, they report what they want to report, but the, uh, you know, the rumors and the uh, uh, people in the know say that uh, the numbers are quite different, they're quite, quite larger. So for them to actually be showing an increase, you know, albeit a small one, I think it's a, it's a signal. Um, and uh, this is not just them buying. Uh, the reports are that most central banks are buying and, uh, you know, the ones that are publicly uh, um, declare what they're doing, you know, we can we can see those um, uh, increasing their stockpiles. So something, I think this, this China gold um, news is important. Uh, the market seems to have just uh, brushed it aside. I think it's more important. Um, the other thing, UK housing, uh, month on month drop, was very steep and we are seeing a, a correction starting there as well. And and remember UK housing, housing in the UK is a huge part of the economy, always has been. Uh, I remember when I bought a property there, how easy it was, how tax friendly it is. It's really, really uh, an amazing way to park your money. And I always laugh, um, my brother lives in a big development in Chelsea and um, uh, you know, all the footballers live there and all the Chinese people buy uh, and, and Russians, you know, they buy houses there and, and flats. And I would say two thirds of them are empty. So you go there at night, there's no light anywhere. And there's only a few here and there because it's just people parking their money there. So it's been a, yeah. it's been a, a very easy way and efficient way of, of you know, putting aside uh, money um, for, for people from around the world. And um, it's it's been driving, you know this, Ryan, it's been, it's been driving prices to ridiculous levels. And I think a correction will be more than welcome and, and it's 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 uh, overdue, long overdue. So I think um, as with everything, the, the US leads the way, then, you know, the UK and Europe follows. And we've seen in the US housing take a turn lower. And um, I think the UK is, is starting to follow. Uh, higher rates, higher mortgage rates, higher yields are going to take their toll on uh, housing. And uh, as I said before, a correction would be beneficial for the market overall. You know, you can't keep going up in a straight line. So, yeah, no, exactly. And the, the, the thing also to note is that, you know, we've come through Brexit, we've come through the GFC, the banking crisis, everything like that. And house prices have remained resilient throughout. There's been no major crash in, in housing prices or, or big significant corrections even through all those events so yeah we you know we are seeing rates rise which is going to have an impact on prices and um, that was something we didn't really see to this extent um, through all those events as we came out of them um, so yeah there, there is a basis for a bit of a correction um, yeah. but I'm, I'm certainly not seeing any real you know red flags waving here that prices are going to tumble 10 20 30 percent anything like that no, uh, no, not yet. You, you're absolutely right. You know what? It's funny. I bought a flat in London in 2004. And uh, as a crisis hit 2008, early 2009, I managed to find a buyer, nice little profit, sold it. I'm like, oh my God, this was the best timing ever. You know, this is going to collapse. Yeah. And I think prices went down like 5% and then just never looked back. And I'm like, do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway yeah, yeah, no. so, so we haven't seen a correction at all. Uh, that's amazing no. with UK housing. Anyway. No, but it, I mean, it is it is showing that you know signs are topping out because when you when you've got people who can't get properties uh, because they're so expensive, um, there's got to come a moment where everyone's finished trading up, trading down, um, yeah. And you know, property prices got to do something. You've you've got to have people coming, being able to get in the market. Now, if you're if you're a twenty year old, nineteen twenty, or leaving school, just got a job, you're on maybe twenty, twenty five, thirty k. Um, you know, if you live in the, the south, it, or even some places in the north, you've got two hopes of getting a house, you just can't afford it. Uh, yeah, it's well out, well out of reach. And there's a big difference, you know, there always has to be a catalyst for uh housing uh, to turn lower, and there wasn't one. Obviously, that the, the, the financial crisis was huge, but look at what happened to rates, they went down to zero. I remember people buying mortgages at at uh, li uh li base rate plus you know, half a percent. <laughs> yeah. which was uh, incredible. This now has changed for the first time in, in over a decade. You know, these these mortgage rates, uh, we've, we haven't seen them in, in many, many years. So I think this is the catalyst, which is probably going to bring a correction. Is it going to be huge? Yeah. I don't think so, but it's long overdue. Yeah, no, I agree. And if you, if you couldn't get a mortgage when rates were at uh, zero, you're not going to get a mortgage when rates were at four or five percent. So uh, 
yeah, definitely an issue that uh, needs solving. Um, Kay, you got anything uh, you want to uh, add to the mix? Um, no, just a, <clears throat> a, a study out um, by the FT overnight, um, talking, um, well, polling 45 economists about uh, what they expect for the US unemployment rate to, to be at the end of 2023. Um, and that has to do with uh, Powell and, uh, and, and basically all central bankers saying that there is a possibility of a soft landing. So a soft landing would mean that we are end up somewhere around four, four and a half or so percent. But uh, that study in the FT, um, the economists um, rather are, are rather um, centered around the five to five and a half percent uh, unemployment uh, rate in the US, which would be a lot less of a soft uh, of a soft landing, if if that would materialize. But that was just uh, one thing I was reading overnight um on, on the overnight news and that's um um and 85 percent of them um are for a recession by uh, during 2023 so um that 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 little bit of an um an uh, on the side about what uh, people expect for the uh, for the us and uh, unemployment next year um because as we've been uh, discussing and uh, noticing as well is that uh, Labour market is still holding up uh, rock solid right now, uh, where people were already expecting it to to start to uh, slow down. But um, still, economists for 2023 expect it to get worse, and that's the only thing I really saw that may uh, add to to what all the rest that you have been uh, saying already. I think you covered uh, everything. <laughs> cool. Um, so this this Russia Ukraine stuff. It... Maybe I'm asking because I want to be calmed that it's not a big deal. Is it? Is it going to? Could this lead to uh, uh, an increase in hostilities? That they're now actively attacking inside Russia's borders. Uh, yeah, that's a good uh, question. <laughs> yeah, that's an answer. It, well, I mean, it also has the adverse effect. The the other side effect, right? They they show that they can actually um, cause damage well within. Russian soil, right? So mm -hmm. it's uh, in in the negotiating table. I think this gives more strength to the Ukrainian side. But uh, when you're dealing with somebody like Putin, you know what's the effect? I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm he... I'm torn. I, I have trouble mm -hmm. um, deciding if it's good or bad. Yeah, That's a fifty fifty question, mate. Um, yeah, it, if if worse comes to worse, it could. Uh... Uh, unfortunately, uh, bring his uh, hand closer to the red button, but uh, let, let's hope it uh, reinforces Ukraine uh, rather than the opposite. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, I'll stop uh, shivering about that one for the moment. Um, <laughs> let's start looking at some of the prices. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, dollar's been uh, strengthening again um, this morning. Uh, we've seen some some decent moves. I don't know if this is just a, a risk trade, um, risk off trade. You know, as mentioned, we're seeing oil coming off again. Um, is this going back to the old uh, things are looking grim? So let's buy some dollars. Um, certainly for dollar yen, we've we've got back up to this old fib level around about the the one thirty seven seventies. Um, have nicked uh, just above it, but it's a a, a bit of an area. Um, if we get above there, then we're probably on for, for 138, maybe even more uh, if this wants to push higher. I think we do need to keep an eye on, on oil at the moment. Um, as I say, it's looking a bit of a rift driver. Um, again, not sure why it's continuing to, to tumble. Obviously, the, we may be switching from, uh, in terms of China, switching from the reopening positivity to the economic negativity, um, as mentioned, as seen in the data. Um, but then we're not generally not seeing commods following suit uh, you know the precious metals yeah they're off a bit but um, you know not so much like gold um, silver so it's it's not wholesale what, what are you guys making of this uh, what are we trading are we trading some year end stuff position closing are we trading global growth what, what are we trading here I have no clue man <laughs> I said it yesterday I really don't know I don't, I, I don't know Okay, <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, <laughs> Kay, Kay's putting more decorations on his Christmas tree. <laughs> yeah, perhaps uh, the the today's leg is um, with those negative Chinese numbers, but it's it's all a bit of uh, Harry hindsight comments. Um, 
it feels like the market, uh, as I was saying yesterday, trying to, to buy a rumor and then forced to sell if the rumor doesn't materialize. Um, we're on big levels. Huh? I'll, I'll show the uh, crude if you want a little later. We're, we're really on yeah. big levels uh, here. Um, and uh, perhaps we are going to uh, to get into the SPR uh, bit uh, bit zone uh, after all. Uh, the ones that we really um, need to pay attention to is OPEC because uh, the uh, Brent and they were talking about Brent actually is firmly below eighty bucks again. They could be um, looking at uh, at cutting some uh, some uh, output again. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be it's going to to be interesting to see what happens here. Um, I I really and because as well, if you look at the API uh, data last night, we saw again uh, a six and a half million uh, barrels uh, draw. I don't know whether there was compensation in in, in other instruments, but we, we've seen only draws of of late, and and oil, go, um, oil sorry, just uh, continues to sleep. I don't know. I, I don't have the explanation as to why it just continues to come come down. Yeah. I mean, you know, just just to point out, I mean, here we have, uh, you know, the three of us who, who've been in this game a long time and, and stay all mentioned yesterday. There's sometimes where you just don't know. And you look at you look around the various different markets for clues. What's driving what? You know, why is oil down? Is it a global growth issue? Then you look at yields. Um, for example, look at US tens, um, a good benchmark for for risk and stuff, and not doing an awful lot. Then you look at gold. You know, is there a risk trade there? Again, not doing an awful lot. Um, so it becomes a, a question. Look around different assets, trying to get a gauge, a feeling for what's going on in the market. And sometimes you, you, there's just nothing. You, you get no tells, no triggers, um, anything like that. And so for trading, you've got to be a bit more careful because you know, you can get a headline or a move that's chased and, and pushed around um, that's not entirely real. Um, you know, dollar yen, oil, you could say that's OK, fine. That's on the, the risk trade with the worst Chinese numbers. So you're going to need to watch your levels. Um, and this is a, a level up here that we need to keep an eye on. You know, it was a former big support point after we made a, a big break from it. Um, and it's in action again. So if we can't get above there, then you've got to say, well, OK, this this risk off move is only going to be pushed so far. What does that mean? Does that mean we head back down to the 134s, 133s? Um, you know, China, we've had all this news, even with the data uh, and dollar one's done nothing over it. Um, not even a look at seven, not even a look down to the lows. So all these little indications that you can't real get a fee, feel for the market. You just got to come down to, to stick into short term trades, trade your levels, keep it tight um, and just look to, to snipe around uh, more so. Uh, Kay, do you want to have uh, a quick look then? And you can do a bit more in depth into oil. Uh, yeah, sure, mate. Um, right. And you can tell us exactly why oil is moving the way it is, OK? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and um, so I will. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I want eight bullet points. Report, uh, please. No, you can have one. More uh, <laughs> more sellers than buyers. <laughs> and that's uh, that's the uh, the watertight uh, reason for uh, oil being lower, mate. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is uh, Aussie Kiwi, Lucas. I'm I'm looking at it every day and in the chat room. <laughs> Uh, you must be, are you Charlie, Charlie's brother? Uh, uh. So here, uh, this is the 72.90 on oil. We're right on it. Uh, well, we have, we're actually bouncing just a little bit. Um, but um, I, as I was showing this morning in the, in the chat room, this, uh, this 63.67, um, even if you look at the, the, the longer term, this uh, 63.67 is a bit of um, an equilibrium zone, in my opinion. And perhaps it's not really um, innocent that the uh, SPRs um, are, are trying to, uh, to buy it uh, in, in 70 and below. And if you look at the uh, bit of a trend line here as well, coming in uh, just uh, below that zone as well. 
So for the longer term, this one for me is going to be monster important. I can stretch it to 61, 62. Um, it's, it's a big move, but uh, we have done big moves. So uh, in the more medium term, don't, uh, don't be surprised that, uh, that such moves can, can still unfold. Um, and, and I think, and as I was saying yesterday as well, I think some of it has to do uh, with the fact that the, the market is only half believing that China is going to reopen uh, massively. Um, so the, the cities are coming up with plans to, to uh, scale down on the, um, on the, the, the mass testing and stuff like that. But um, if you look at it, it's, it's not part of Xi's um, um, structural plan or, or base plan. His plan was to really uh, combat the virus as, as hard as he could. So um, there's going to be a lot of cities, they can say whatever they like, but uh, at the end of the day, when the Central uh, Communist Party government says, um, now, well, we, we are going to keep uh, uh, it a bit tight, um, well, I mean, those reopenings are going to be very slow, as we have already been saying before. Um, so that may be part of uh, w what's going on in, uh, in, in those oils and, and uh, things. So here is the WTI, I uh, think, very important zone around here. Um, and uh, if ever that breaks, then I think the big equilibrium zone will be here. Um, and going to stick my neck out, I think this one will hold. Um, whatever happens, because time will, we probably will need a bit of time to be in there. We know that there are, that there are going to be uh, bids down there as well. Uh, we know that. So um, um, this, this zone, in my opinion, is has a very, very good chance to hold if we uh, ever get down there. Um, on, um, on Brent, we are actually not far from decent levels here. Um, 77.40 is the uh, is the uh, fifty percent of the whole um, pandemic and 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 what ensued um, rally? So this is an important level in my opinion. The this downward channel, um, the other one has been broken. So uh, this one on the break did a bit of retest uh, around eighty eight, and now we're like already ten bucks lower. So this is all a medium term, okay, guys. This is not for um, trading the next five minutes. Um, so 77.40, 76 bucks is going to be important. And then um, pretty similar to what uh, <coughs> to what's happening in um, in uh, WTI, then we are we need to look at this long term uh, longer term area. And, and that area seems to come in around 65 to 70 bucks in, in Brent. Um, and I think that's where really uh, the music stops playing or starts playing again. So that's uh, that's basically the medium term view on the orders that I have from where I'm sitting. Um, quick look at the metals. Well, okay, this 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 probably been the buildup of Chinese gold then. Um, but look at this uh, 65 60 zone that should really hold. We are trading around 70, so 70, 73, so a bit in the middle of nowhere to me. Um, silver as well, uh, toying with uh, with this 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 zone. Um, we need to to get uh, back, stay below 20 to 20, then 22 in the shorter term. But I still think the biggest support will come in around mid 21s, if if seen. If we start to get back above 2260, then I think there's a fair chance we are going to, to have a revisit of, uh, of those highs. Um, for the time being, I'm, I'm just being patient really with, uh, with my long terms. Um, all right, Euro Yen. Well, sometimes people look at, well, people ask about those uh, Yen pairs. I, I mean, trying to, to accompany this, uh, this little break here, uh, around 143, 65, 70, um, I'm at that just above, um, 144, figure five, figure 10, uh, is a bit of a very, very short term support now. Um, but if, uh, if this break is confirmed, why not uh, have a look back into the 145s or so? It does seem that uh, that 
Yen crosses um, have been coming back, and it, it's gone without the yields, um, which, which is a bit uh, a bit surprising. Uh, but that may have to do um, with with all those uh, stimulus packages, and and actually the the news of the uh, of the increase in reserves, despite uh, the interventions. That's a that's a bit of a a bit of an odd uh, one, I will say. Um, uh, Dollar yen um, forming a bit of a channel here inside. We could form a bit of a what is it wedge, whatever. Um, yeah, wedge. Um, intermediate support, very short term, right where we are here. But then I'd say keep an eye on 136.90. This trend line, which we have been toying with, around 136.50.60. Um, and then yesterday's low coming in around this this little trend line here, just uh, around 136, uh, the figure. Um, that for the dollar yen top side, we need to break above 137.90 uh, to have a look at 138.10 ish, 10 15, 10 20. Um, I think that's where uh, the prior low also lies in this uh, uh, 137.90. So. Um, this 137.90, 138.20 could be a, a bit of a hurdle uh, right now. And um, as we are seeing the dollar giving back some, um, it, it could be confirmed that this, uh, this was a bit of a high that we've seen uh, right now. And we may be ready to go um, for a test of the underside, perhaps, of the, of the channel again. Um, yeah, well, the Aussie Kiwi, it's our daily, uh, daily little update. Um, Still not, uh, still not cooperating. Still not bouncing. We are in this. Uh, everybody's looking at the seventy-eight point six around. What is it? Forty or so. That's what the people are looking at. All I, and as I said, this forty-sixty zone is a bit. This is is a support. It is a support. Uh, it's also a prior low and a prior low here. Um, so it is a support zone. And for those willing to catch a knife, perhaps you can uh, you can hide your uh, stops if you already want to um, be long, as I know many of you want to. Um, this is coming in around, this support line is coming in around 105, 20, 10, 20. Um, if you want to build up some security, put it below 105, if you want to catch a knife here. But um, yeah, it's per, it's perhaps the zone. Um, the market is really trading this, uh, this, this divergence between uh, Kiwi and Aussie um, a bit longer uh, than um, what I would have, uh, what I would have expected, uh, especially that we are done with the RBNZ for this year as well. Um, I, I'd say let now the, the data be your guide between uh, between the two, uh, Kiwi and, uh, uh, and, and, and the Aussie, um, to to know whether uh, this is enough or not. I wouldn't be surprised if 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 there are a few stops uh, below here. So perhaps if you want to get into it, um, do small, wait for it to 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 for the stops to be done, and then and then on the failure uh, below fail breakdown, perhaps add again. Um, I repeat, we have to get back above 106, 50, 60 uh, to get some uh, some traction in this one again. I'm just looking at the clock. We're still pretty much okay. Um, Aussie not liking much of its life, right? Um, so uh, yesterday or this morning, yeah, this morning we uh, we came back uh, below this uh, this trend line support, and uh, since then haven't really looked back. And we are trading 66 three quarters. That next support should be around 66 and a half. That's uh, 40.50. That's uh, always that's been traded a, a fair number of times this uh, this level. So 66, 40, 50 is where um, the Aussie should hold, or it could mean more bad news back down to 66 or below. Uh, we need to get back above uh, 66, 10, 15 to to get going again. Um, Kiwi, I haven't really looked at the Kiwi as such of late. Um, Kiwi is still looking a lot better. Than uh, than uh, than the Aussie, and we see it, of course, on on the Aussie Kiwi. Haven't had, don't need to be a, a, a technical analysis specialist to see that Kiwi is doing better. Um, this uh, this here 
Three quarters, 62, three quarters, 90, as long as that holds. Um, whoops, there is um, no harm done for the Kiwi in, uh, in, in, in any uh, scenario. Uh, it's already holding 63, the figure in the meantime, but I, I'd keep an eye on these three quarters, 90, uh, 62, three quarters, 62, 90 on the Kiwi. If, if ever it starts to break down, uh, then there may be uh, maybe a bit more to go back down to 61 and a half or so perhaps. Um, anything else? Anything else? Saurabh, do you think that higher time frame levels, say drawn on a daily, will be stronger on lower time frames, say on hourly, than level drawn on lower time frames? Um, it all depends how you want to trade it, uh, uh, Saurabh. Uh, this this 100 ways to skin a cat, as, as we have already said. But if ever, whatever you want to trade, it's always um, worth looking at the, the, the longer term picture first and then starting to drill down within that longer term picture to, um, to get a feel of, uh, of, of what's going on in the, in the, um, in the shorter term. You, you can never, you can never, yeah, as Brian says, top down analysis, you, you can never forget the big picture when, when you're trading. You always have to have the big picture in uh, in in the, in your mind, um, because that's where the bigger levels will show. If you say, for instance, um, if we look at the uh, the dollar yen on the on the longer term, if you look at the dollar yen on the longer term, well, maybe I can kill that one. Um, when, when we broke above this uh, trend line back in May 2021 and then um, went back to retest uh, those, those lows and then started to, to, um, to move higher. If you look at purely technically, once it's broken here, it, it never looked back and you, you are going to, to, to find a very, very big trend, which um, a couple of us really played very nicely. And then within, within that, then you you get back to your um, lower time frames to um, to have a look if you find patterns again uh, about the stepping stones to 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 get higher. So yes, I do think that you really need to to look at the longer term first before um, getting into the into the shorter term. And once you get the long term picture, then you can fool around with with whatever short term is uh, is going on. Then you then you trade shorter term patterns, like for instance this triangle on the on, on the Aussie Kiwi, which is only um, four or five months old. Um, and and then you can trade again inside of that um, if you want. But you always need to look at the long term picture. The, you this triangle can only, let's say, be formed because you have a long-term move up, which is then uh, which is then correcting, right? This is this is what I mean by drill down from uh, the long term to the to the shorter term. Um, that is if you do it purely on uh, on, on technical analysis. Uh, why the longer term is also more important because that's where the fundamentals are laid to create your uh, your 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 technical patterns. Um, there's no way. Dollar yen would have risen um, 50, 50 odd big figures from the lows if there wouldn't have been a divergence in um, in 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 the Fed and the Bank of Japan. If Kuroda wouldn't have said that uh, they wouldn't, they were not like any other central bank. So they would continue to to press the the easing uh, button, and and therefore we have created uh, the market or well. There, there has been the creation of a very wide differential between the dollars and uh, and the uh, and the Japanese yen. We've had a monster rally in uh, oil prices, energy prices. So Japan was uh, was um, uh, put under pressure because their all their imports were uh, much higher, and uh, at the same time the government uh, was was putting in stimulus package after stimulus package. So without the fundamentals, your technical picture would have been <coughs> created. So uh, that's the only thing I wanted to add on that. And perhaps for today, this is going to be it. Um, dollar China, Ryan already touched upon it. Um, yeah, this trend line is starting to get a little bit watered down. So um, 
I'd say watch those uh, prior lows and then, of course, the, the head and shoulders uh, is valid as long as we are below 701, 702, whatever. Um, there's still potential to go, if it breaks actually back below 696, there may be some potential to get uh, to get perhaps down to 690 uh, eventually. That is how, that will depend on how fast uh, the Chinese cities reopen. And with that, Ryan, for today, that's enough for me. Thank you very much, mate. Um, yeah, I'll grab that back quickly. Uh, still, anything you want to throw in before I, I look at a couple of bits? Or you no, I'm good. Uh, I'm good. I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a little overview uh, tomorrow, but uh, I'm good yeah. for now. So just just to remind folks, I'm going to be off tomorrow. Um, so Stell's going to have uh, crack open his charts. So please make sure you you're asking him about. Uh, um, you know, Brazilian real, Polish lots of crosses, <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that, uh, and get him in. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to echo what Kay's just been saying about looking at the long term time frames. They are very important, very, very important um, that you drill down because it gives you a sense of what's going on. It's easy to go into a 30 minute, 50 minute, 15 minute hourly chart uh, and get caught up in a noise. And you've got to understand what the main trend is outside of that noise. You look at dollar yen, um, you know, massive rally from the 102s, huge rally. Does it look like we're changing it yet? No, we can't even break the 50 of this move. We can't even get to the 38.2 of the 102 rally. So big trend is still in play. But then you flip to something like a monthly chart and you ask the question, what does this mean in terms of everything that's historical? Um, you know, we had a huge fib coming up. Uh, when we're in the 150, getting up towards that 152 level, the 38.2 fib of that massive move from there, you know, across decades. Um, you know, so you look at the context, you say, well, is dollar yen strong in the context of the last 30 years? Well, it's not. So it may have been very strong over the last 18 months. It's not strong in the, in the sense of the last 30 years. So that's why you need your top down view start off at your big levels, always have an idea of what, what the bigger trends are, the wider trends are, then you can get down into the lower stuff. As Kay mentioned, you trade the ranges within ranges within ranges. Um, but you need that big picture view just so you know what the, the, the bigger trends are going on. Um, I've not got a lot to add. I had a little long yesterday after in um, Euro Sterling, just on the back of that, that, that pound move. Um, yesterday into the fix and on that news I missed it down to the, the 50s um, or down to the 70s down there in that move but I picked it up a bit of 90 just a nothing massive just want to run it um, I have got out of a bit uh, early and some around the 37s um, we're in this up towards this zone uh, again you're looking at longer term stuff a big zone that's been a big feature of this pair uh, going back between 86 45 and 70 um this is the band we're up to you know if we if we're going to continue climbing if this move is to continue need to get through there i'm expecting to see some resistance coming in maybe 55 60s um just based on the the last move that we saw there late november um and then this 70 75 area is potential resistance again you know crack through that we might have another go at 87 which was yet another former resistance point and an old level that we've watched time and time again up towards 1520. Um, as for that, I'm not, I'm managing my Aussie dollar long as I say managing, I'm sitting back and watching. It is looking a bit weakened now. We've broken this, uh, potentially broken this shorter term uptrend um, that came off the rally that we saw from the 64, 63s. Um, again, a little bit of a zone, as Kate mentioned, I've, I've got it more sort of 65, 80 ish. Um, get through there. We're going to be looking on these sort of lows again, 66, 40, 45. Um, if we get down to this sort of area, that's potentially going to be very interesting down to 65, 90, 66. Um, that could potentially be the maker or breaker uh, of this rally here. If we get under there, we could see it unfolding pretty quickly. Um, Fundamentally, I don't see any reason why Aussie dollar should, should pull back that significantly unless the dollar really starts to take off. Um, and I really only see the dollar continuing this strength in, in more of a risk on mood rather than 
a more hawkish Fed or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the FOMC is obviously still a, a, a two-sided risk, um, but on balance, I can't see them being any more hawkish than they have been now. Um, the market knows what it's getting. Um, so really, how much upside can the FOMC give us? There's still a risk always, um, but I think it's it's bleak. So I'm still bearish US dollar um, and still happy to be long this pair for the longer term. Um, but uh, probably I'm going to be riding this through uh, the early part of next year to see if we're going to get any further direction on that. And that's that. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming to the Flow Show. Um, as mentioned, I'll leave you in the capable hands of Stell and Kay tomorrow. Um, get those questions up. Get them up for Stell. He needs he needs questions. Lots and lots of questions. Oh, um, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, <laughs> Kay, will, Kay will have a couple of points of news for the first five minutes and still do the rest of the show. Yeah, I'm, all right, I'll stop, I'll stop, I'll stop. Um, so, anyway, have a great day tomorrow. Have a great day for the rest of the day. Thank you for coming to the Flow Show. Thank uh, you, have still. a good one, all. Ta-ta. Cheers, everyone. Hey, traders, this is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.